Will the next U.S. military airlift be out of Washington, D.C. as the American empire implodes on itself? Asks Robert Bridge. Reminiscent of the U.S. airlift out of Saigon during the Vietnam War, this week's evacuation of the U.S. Embassy in Kabul portends bad times for the United States, which is beleaguered by much more than just military dysfunction. By their very definition, iconic photographs like a bolt of lightning out of a clear blue sky are not really supposed to ever occur twice. Iconic photographs like the one showing Neil Armstrong taking the first step out onto the fake moon or the naked girl fleeing a napalm bombing during the Vietnam War are unique in that they capture the spirit of a generation or a period of time, the so-called zeitgeist. Last week, the world was treated to an iconic Kodak moment as photographers captured stark images of Chinook helicopters buzzing the U.S. Embassy in the Afghan capital, where the airlifted personnel out of the, uh, the Dodge ahead of a tenacious Taliban advance. And just like that, America's 20-year military adventure in Afghanistan originally planned to destroy Osama bin Laden and his Al-Qaeda franchise crumbled like a state cookie before lunchtime, and it fell fast. A person needn't be a history buff to experience a sense of deja vu from watching those incredible images out of Kabul. Most people recall vivid images of the, of the day, April 30th, 1975 to be exact, when the Viet Cong captured Saigon, forcing the U.S. military to conduct a massive airlift operation from the roof of the U.S. Embassy. The U.S. military's humilia- humiliating defeat rammed home the point that firepower alone is not enough to destroy an enemy, according to Oliver Stone and Peter Kuznick in their book, The Untold History of the United States. American forces, quote, had dropped more bombs on tiny Vietnam than had been dropped by all sides in all previous wars throughout history, three times as many explosives that were dropped by all sides in World War II. The horrors of warfare aside, another question that needs to be addressed is, quote, what now for the United States superpower? Will future historians point to America's disastrous defeat in Afghanistan, for there really is no other way to describe it, as the main reason for its decline and the ultimate destruction? After all, according to some historians, the collapse of the Soviet Union was put in motion by its own lengthy Afghan war from 1979 to 1989. The theory is tempting one, considering that just two years after the Soviets called it quits in Afghanistan, the Soviet Union had been relegated to an ash heap of history. Only an individual fully immersed in the myth of American exceptionalism would refuse to believe that such a catastrophic collapse could equally befall the United States, which incidentally spent some $2 trillion only to score an own goal against the undefeated graveyard of empires. That's what they call Afghanistan. Even without the ignominy, uh, the ignominy, ignominy, oh God, I hate that word, of the momentous military defeat, however, things are looking bad in the land of liberty. Indeed, not since the days of the Civil War has America appealed, appeared so dangerously fractured and unsustainable as a, a viable and united polity amid a climate of bitter partisan acrimony Talk of secession is rife as Democrats and Republicans no longer fighting the predictable political battles of yesteryear, mostly centered on taxes, find it almost impossible to live peacefully together under a single roof. It goes on a little bit more there, but it's true in that respect. And I'll read a little bit from this book, and then I want to get to Donald Trump's statement today, and then some general thoughts. So here's where they bring up... um, So this is written by Rodney Howard Brown and Paul Williams. Paul Williams actually did a standalone book on Operation Gladio, which you should definitely read because you should know about it. But here you go. Rules of engagement. This is after about talking. This is after about laying out all of the lies about the Gulf of Tonkin uh, incident and what was to be done from there. Despite the use of chemical weapons, the Vietnam War was not only to be limited, but also fought with extraordinary restrictions, known as rules of engagement. These rules prohibited American soldiers from firing at the Viet Cong unless they were being fired upon, and even when attacked, when they, uh, they were forbidden to pursue the enemy into Laos or Cam- Cambodia. In accordance with some of the same restrictions, American pilots could only bomb targets that were deemed strategic by the Joint Chief of Staff, and they were not allowed to destroy Viet Cong missile sites that were still under construction. How convenient. Hey, listen, we weren't able to bomb uh, ISIS convoys 
And whenever we were going to lay bombs down, the Obama administration was always very good about dropping leaflets to make sure everybody got out first. So it's the same war. In 1968, Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant General Ira C. Eaker observed the following. Our political leaders elected to fight a land war where every advantage lay with the enemy and to employ our vast sea and air superiority in very limited supporting roles. Surprise, perhaps the greatest of the principles of war, was deliberately sacrificed when our leaders revealed our strategy and tactics to the enemy. The enemy was told that we would not drop bombs on populated areas, heavily heavy industry, canals, dams, and other critical targets, and thus sanctuaries were established by us along the Chinese border and around Haiphong and Hanoi. This permitted the enemy to concentrate anti-aircraft defenses around the North Vietnamese targets that our Air Force was permitted to attack, greatly increasing our casualties. Missiles, oil, and ammunition were permitted to enter Haiphong Harbor unmolested and without protest. It's the same deal. It's the same exact war. It's the same exact war, only Afghanistan was longer. And less American, citizens, uh, American soldiers died, but um, civilian casualties, the, the collateral damage in, in Afghanistan and especially Iraq, over a million civilians died there. What are we doing? And what the hell were we going to leave behind? And why? Why? 